Good evening. My name is Robert Boynton. I run the literary reportage concentration here at uh, the Arthur L. Carter Journalism Institute at NYU. I want to welcome you to this evening. Uh, it's a great privilege to have uh, uh, so many uh, fine artists uh, up on uh, the dais with me. Um, on my far left is also, by the way, this is the tallest group of people I've ever sat with here. Um, Alex Marshall on my far left is a journalist who specializes in writing about infrastructure. A graduate of hmm, some school uptown, Columbia Journalism School, he started his career as a reporter for the Virginia Pilot. He is the author of three books, The Surprising Design of Market Economies, Beneath the Metropolis, and How Cities Work. He's also a senior fellow at the Regional Plan Association and a visiting lecturer on infrastructure at the School of Architecture at the New Jersey Institute of Technology. Uh, to my not so far left, Gay Talese, the author of 11 books. He was a reporter for the New York Times from 1956 to 1965 and has since written for the Times, as for Esquire, The New Yorker, Harper's, and, and many other magazines and newspapers. He was born in Ocean City, New Jersey, and lives in New York City. And his 1966 article, Frank Sinatra Has a Cold, was named the best story Esquire has ever published. And we're here, of course, because of the republication of his fantastic book, The Bridge, about the building and the people who built the Verrazano Narrows uh, Bridge. Uh, on my immediate left is Robert Walsh, the head of the Iron Workers Local 40. He grew up in the Fordham section of the Bronx and is the fourth generation of his family to become an iron worker. He began his career at age 19, which we can document right there. Um, on the Verrazano Bridge and went to work at, on Madison Square Garden, the General Motors Building, the Tappan Zee Bridge, the Williamsburg Bridge, the World Trade Center, and many, many other bridges and buildings. So th this is an interesting occasion. We, we, one of the things we really wanted to do was uh, bring attention to not just uh, a fantastic book on its republication and the anniversary of an amazing bridge 50 years later, but also to, in the spirit of Gay's book, which is really about the people who build things, it's a story of human beings and their labors, we were really delighted that uh, Mr. Walsh was willing to come by and talk as well. And as I talked with him this morning, one of the things that really interested me and the real uh, sort of connection I saw as well between his work and Gay's work is that, you know, if anyone who's read Gay Talese's work knows that what, what beyond the subject, whether it's sex in America or the mafia or the New York Times, what he's really interested in is intergenerational conflict and, 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 uh, and families and the way that ideas and people change over generations. I mean, that's the sort of the most enduring and the most powerful uh, subject of his. And I was, I was really uh, knocked out talking to uh, Bob Walsh about his family. His family came, the, his great, was it great uh, grand uncle? Uncles came t from Ireland, from County Cork in 1888 and started building bridges and, and doing iron work here. And uh, it's the uh, work and the family has been going on ever since. And I say he's the fourth generation, which I think is right. And then his children are, of course, as well uh, involved in, in uh, iron work. So I really see not just the, the connection being not only the subject matter of bridges and building, but really this, this idea that something gets into the blood of a family, something becomes a tradition and a lived tradition uh, and not just one in which uh, people are doing similar things, but actually building things that leave a mark and are you know, as close as we mortals will ever get to immortality, whether it's a, a fine book uh, which stays in print or a bridge which stays up for a long time. And I was hoping maybe you could start off, uh, Mr. Walsh, talking a bit about, you were taking me through some of the um, some of the actual roles of various people as they build bridges and what, you know, I was asking what it is you were doing there and you started talking about different roles because I was, the question I was asking you and I guess I'm asking again is, is, you know, bridge building as your, you know, great, great grandparents did it say in the 1880s or you did it in the, it's a big leap, you did it in the 1960s and now in 2014. Um, how much is it the same? How much has it changed? And, and, and what are some of the basic uh, roles that bridge builders, iron workers play? Well, good evening, first of all. And I have to thank Gay Talese for inviting me. Uh, he's, a, he's a gentleman. He really is. 
and a pleasure to deal with. But, uh, and thank you all for coming as well. Um, it really, if you wanted to do a suspension bridge, it would be more or less the same way of doing that. It's a structure that has to be done this way. They haven't found shortcuts to do it or anything like that. Buildings, they found shortcuts to do. They've improved the, uh, the machinery to hoist all the steel, change the cranes. They used to have guy derricks. Guy derricks is like a, a spider up on top of a building. Some of the older people might have seen uh, guy derricks on top of buildings. But now they have high-speed cranes. They call them kangaroos, favco cranes. They work completely a lot faster probably a lot safer as well. The work isn't as hard today on the buildings as it was years ago. It was a lot more manual work years ago. Uh, but on the bridges, it's the same work. Um, uh, the Tappan Zee now will be a different bridge altogether. The Verrazano is what you call a suspension bridge. The Tappan Zee is a cantilever bridge. Now they have cranes that can come along in the water and set these huge amounts of steel, tons and tons of steel with one, one lift off a barge. Uh, these bridges that span the waters out there, like the Narrows Gap, uh, you wouldn't be able to do that. It, uh, you have to have a certain amount of height for the, uh, uh, to clear the water for all the Coast Guard boats and uh, everything like that. Um, but the bridges haven't changed that much. It's the same type of work. And as Rob, uh, said the picture in back of me there where I'm standing on something. Actually, what I'm standing on is the wire that gets spun across back and forth, back and forth. That yellow wheel, what you see is, is it has two grooves on it, on each, one on each side. And it drags wire across from one anchorage to the other. And you'd have two wheels, and they both start simultaneously in the anchorage. They'd come and they'd cross in the center of the bridge, and you'd have to let it go back to the other side. One goes to Brooklyn, the other one goes to Staten Island. When they meet in the middle of the bridge, you have to tie down the wires in what you'd call a wicket. The wire would fit in between the steel bracket. We used to call it a wicket. And it would space the wires out. And that's what I'm standing on right there now. That's probably probably maybe about two months old of wire that was spun back and forth. The wire is about the size of a, the lead, lead in a pencil or in a wooden pencil. And you can imagine how long it would take. Well, it took a good few months to spin all of that cable. That's what you call spinning the cable back and forth. And, and Robert, could I just interrupt yeah. quickly? Uh, a sort of obvious question is, what was it like in what standing, however high up in the air there, uh, you know, in that picture, which it must have been relatively routine. I think, I think to a layman, that's what you instantly sees on. These guys are standing up in the middle of the sky. And, and uh uh, <laughs> Actually, it was just another, if you want, I'll start from the very beginning when I first went out to the bridge, if you want. And uh, what happened was there was a bunch of apprentices they needed to do this work because it wasn't for that many jour journeymen at that time when they were spinning the cable. They needed a lot more apprentices because there wasn't that much more journeyman work at the time there. But what happened was you'd sign up in the office. Um, I met a fellow there, he was the shop steward, and he says, come into this room, and he sounded like he was Irish to me. Both my parents were Irish. <laughs> and I says, oh, what part of Ireland are you from? Well, he says, I'm not, you know, and I said, I thought he was really kidding me, I'll be honest with you. So anyway, uh, I says, no, come on, really, where are you from? Oh, he said he was from Newfoundland. I didn't know where the hell Newfoundland was at that time. <laughs> I was only out of school and I didn't know where Newfoundland was. And it's uh, the province, the, the, the most eastern part of Canada anyway. For those that don't know, <laughs> I'm sure you do today. But anyway, um, I got a kick out of this fellow. He was the shop steward on the job. So we all got signed up. Um, I actually was, uh, I was still 17 at the time when I signed up. And he was supposed to be 18, but they weren't that you know, it wasn't that, uh, you didn't have to worry about being 18, showing all your cards or anything like today, you have to. So anyway, we went down to the pier, uh, and then, uh, so this was on the Staten Island side, and uh, underneath the tower was this elevator, it was a cage, and uh, there was probably about 16 or 18 of us in, this, uh, in the elevator. And as, as the elevator started to go up, it was just hung by cables. Mm -hmm. 
That's all it was, and it was guiding you up. So as we're going up, the wind starts to pick up, and then all of a sudden, I suppose it was a gag that was all set up with the operator on the elevator, and a couple of journeymen were in it as well, and all of a sudden, the elevator stops, and one of them yells out, oh shit, don't tell me it's gonna drop again. <laughs> so, so it scared the living hell out of a lot of guys, I'll be honest with you. By the time we got up to the top, which was uh, 600, I th 690 feet up anyway, um, the wind was blowing pretty good, and by the time we got up to the top, you got off on a landing there, and a lot of the fellows would say, listen, maybe you'll just take us back down again, all right? So some of us, some of us didn't make it, you know? But uh, I just got a kick out of it, I really did. But, uh, you know, I'd expect something like that from people that never did that type of work before, I'll be honest with you. But me being from an iron worker family, you would hear certain things go on, on at the kitchen table and everything like that, you know? But um, I went to work for the fella, he's carrying the bullhorn there. He was a, an, an Indian from Oklahoma, his name was Bonnie Warren, and uh, he was a bit of a character. He had more expressions than you could shake a stick at, and some of them <laughs> I couldn't say here tonight, some of them. But anyway, uh, all the fellas up on top, I know the four fellas, that was my first gang that I went to work for. Uh, and what happened there was they were spinning the cable, the, the hauling cable would bring that wheel back and forth all the time. And every once in a while, the shivs would wear down. You'd call them pulleys, those yellow things. Uh, I think they are yellow, aren't they? Yeah, they yeah. Or orange, whatever color they are. But the cable would jump out of the shiv. And uh, like I said, you'd call it a pulley. You'd have to get come along, you'd have to get up on top of that frame up there, and you'd have to climb up the ladder and walk across to whichever one it was, and you'd have to uh, come along as like a, a winch that you would pull the cable up with. And, um, and to put it back into the shivs again. So you could start the, the movement of the cable again and bring the wire back and forth. Uh, now the Indian is quick to say once we got away from the cable to turn on the wheel again. You know, they used to have, he have a loudspeaker there and he's yelling, they call it a bullhorn, and he'd yell up to the tower and they'd phone down from the tower to tell him to start the cable up again so it could continue on again. Nobody liked to be delayed too long because it gives you a bad record in our business. Uh, it, there's great competition in it. So anyway, um, we would get done with that and back up to the saddle again in the tower, and we'd do our job, just continue, keep on doing the spinning of the cable. But um, like I said, it's, uh, it's a great job, great camaraderie amongst all the iron workers. Uh, some you mightn't get along with, some you do, but uh, it's a terrific job, and that's what I loved all, all my life, I really did. What I was att attracted to as a young reporter, when I started watching the Verrazano in his early stages, <clears throat> before Robert's description of the cables, there was the, the creation of the two towers, the one in Brooklyn and the one in Staten Island, each of them comparable in, in height to a 70-story building. And I, I watched from the early part of 1961 through 1964, through all the stages that are rather complicated, although Robert makes them fairly clear. But that cable that he refers to, those of you who might have been on the marathon ride yesterday, if you were running across the bridge, what you were running across, the roadway, was formed by these cables that Mr. Walsh here was part of spinning. Those cables, that he mentioned they're, they're about the size of a pencil. But there are hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of those pencil-sized cables that are wrapped together in some way that he could probably explain, but it's simple to say they're wrapped together. And they form these large, uh, what do you call them, the, 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 the cables that are made up, there are a million little cables, and then they tie them together, and that forms what holds the bridge together. What do you call that? Actually, uh, what it is is all the wires, then they make a strand out of it. Oh, that's it. They make a strand, they compact it. It's about two feet thick, isn't it? It's uh, three feet in diameter. Three feet in the, diameter. The main, the main cable. And how many of those are on the bridge, the whole? There's four of those. So four of those are actually what hold on when they later on put the steel sections that form the horizontal 
roadway, which the marathon people were all over yesterday, right? That's and right. And the cars and trucks are around every damn night of the day for years and years. That is what really holds that together is these cables. Yes. Right? Uh, well, that's what holds the weight anyway. Yeah. That's what holds all the weight. Yeah. But what happened was the walkways, you can see what where the other fellows are standing on there. They're held up with a cable that is probably a little thicker than the bottom of the bottle there. And that's what went across the bridge, and you would have the walkway attached to that. Yeah. And when all the spinning was completed, those cables would come down, and that's what they used as their suspender ropes. That's what comes down from the main cable out of saddle, out of a, um, a casting. Mm -hmm. after, they, after they compact the whole main cable, it gets rewrapped again with red lead at that time, not today. Uh, it would get all rewrapped, the whole thing. So that's why it looks like all one thing. Yeah. And, <coughs> excuse me. Well, but what I was about to say, I got diverted by cables, but what I got to say, what attracted me to this, to this the, the notion about wanting to write about this, what attracted me, was the use of the hands. Building a skyscraper or a bridge, whatever. Even now I suggest it's true, and Robert will correct me if it's not true, but when, when I first began noticing in 1961, 60, that period, was how this heavy steel hoisted up by these cables and the cranes, and, but still men's hands at some point had to help put into, lock into position before the, 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 the the bolting together. My man's hands were very important, m absolutely unavoidably important to the process of building these gigantic edifices such as this bridge is. And moreover, the ever, uh, ever present danger. He mentions wind, but sometimes the wind stops its direction and you're up there leaning one way and you, you, you are tilted in another way. There's awful amounts of danger in this job. Part of it, I think, that the attraction is that, the riskiness, the risk-taking mentality that's, that obtains. He didn't tell you, but his father, the iron worker who was the, 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 the founding father of this family business, was injured, and he, he wasn't able to work at, on a bridge. And he didn't tell you, but he has two sons that are iron workers. He mentioned passing, he has a lot of generations. But one of the sons, his sons, was so injured he couldn't, he doesn't work anymore. He injured on a bridge. The other son is still active as an iron worker. And those two sons of his have sons that are iron workers. So even though in his own family there are, there's evidence of, and sad evidence of, of the perils of the work, there's still this embracing pride in that work. And the fact that in America, when I started writing, or thinking, researching this book, to this very day, we sometimes don't, no, because we're so involved with our technology and so many of us spend our days using our fingers over laptops. But all around this city and all cities and all parts of this country, there's still great labor and a love of labor in this kind of work. There, there, it's, 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 it's not a lazy country. Sometimes you think, uh, and sometimes you think that the technology does everything. That's not true. There's Rob, this, this kind of work. And Robert, that's why does, does he okay. catching it right? Is, does he, does oh, he, he does certainly he is. Right? And when he said lazy, those guys are gone today. There's yeah. no more of those guys in our business. Well, I'm anyway. telling you that. But, he, but he's getting it, that there is a love of the work yeah, and love of the craft. Yeah, there's great pride in it also. Like, you know, and it's not just from working on the bridge. It's from when you pass a building that you're after working on and completing it. Yeah, you think uh, you own it, don't you? Well, it's just a sense of pride about it. Like, you know, it's a great achievement to do something like that, you know? And working on the bridge was spectacular for me. It really was. I love the bridge work. Okay, I have a question I want to ask you. So you talked about your attraction to this, this project, to writing about this. Now, I went back in the Times and the archives and found you wrote seven articles about this for the, in, in the body of the, the New York Times. Um, can you just tell us the story of how you went from, you know, just sort of becoming interested in this thing in the building of the bridge, writing a few stories, and then basically camping out and, and writing this book? Well, m my, my curiosity and my standards with regard to work really come from a tailor father of mine. <clears throat> and while he didn't deal with cable, he dealt with thread, which is like cable. And I'd watched my father who made suits, and he spent a long time uh, making these suits by hand 
and stitching everything himself rather than with a sewing machine. And he made suits that he wanted to have people wear for their whole lifetime. I'm not saying they did, but he was the first person who instilled in me a pride in craft and the aspiration <coughs> to make things last, to build things that lasted. So jumping ahead to my career as a journalist, it was very much with the expectation that I could write well, or hope to write well enough, in the craft of putting words together and instilling images and creating a communication with the reader that would be a lasting experience for me as a writer and for, for the readers that I attracted. And when you get the right subject, and the subject of the bridge was perfect for me because when I saw the spinning of cable, I was thinking of the thread of my father's tailoring. He had spools hanging from the tailor shop, all kinds of colors of thread, and the fabric was laid out. And then stitching it together reminded me of what Robert went through was spinning the cable. And finally, the product itself. When you saw, when the bridge was finally finished, somewhere in 1964, the bridge was open in, in November, but I think it was several months before. The whole bridge was finished, but the roadway was not so complete that vehicles could go over it. And so a period of a time, maybe two or three months, the whole bridge just stood still. Nobody was on it. It was finished. The iron workers had left. They were taking other jobs. In fact, many of them, parenthetically, not Robert, but I think he went to the from the bridge to the, World's, to the World's Fair of 64, 65 in Queens, some of them went to the building of the, of the, of the World Trade Center, which I'll tell you about later. Uh, but I watched this bridge, not a utilitarian object, just a work of art, waiting for the time when toll gates would have cars and money and cars would go back and forth. But that's just a work of art. It's like a great product, a great painting or, or a great suit my father would have made. You see in museums, the great garments, some of them dating from, from a century ago, or operas that last, you sing, they sing them for 200 years. It was like this work, work of enduring value, and this is connected to what Robert Walsh does uh, and what I try to do and reflect in my writing, and I think justice was done in this book to paying homage to the kind of work that Mr. Walsh and all those other people do. So, so when you were proposing this to the Times, though, did you envision, I mean, I know that, uh, 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 I forgot his first name, uh, Berger, who's doing. Meyer Berger. Meyer Berger, yeah. who's, who's doing the Top and Zay Bridge. Uh, now oh, you mean right now, no, it's Joseph Berger. Joseph Berger. The Meyer Berger is the whole guy that I knew. Yeah. Joseph Berger is doing that. Right. But, but, did, but is that what you envisioned? With all due respect to the, to, to the, to the Tarot Town, uh, uh, Top and Zay Bridge, I mean, uh, it's not a great work of art. Mm. But is that what you envision doing? Is that because I mean, I gather at some point you said to the, your editors, "This is what I want to do." For the yeah, next I few wanted years. to do it because when I first heard about it, it was going to be the longest suspension bridge in the country or in the world. It is in the country still. But what's so beautiful about a suspension bridge is the way it's like a harp. It's like a, 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 the, the the cable. That I mean, the Verrazano Bridge, the George Washington Bridge, in a way, uh, or the Brooklyn Bridge are great works of art. I can't say as much for the, for the Queensboro Bridge or the, because a cantilever bridge doesn't have that artistic shape to it. Do, do you agree or you, know, you care? I mean, guess you care, don't you? I, yeah, well, I like, a, I like all the bridges now, to be honest with you. <laughs> it gives us work, that's for sure. <laughs> but uh, no, I can understand what Gay is saying. It's like, it is like a work of art, a suspension bridge, it really is. You agree, Because no, of the work that goes into it. Uh, you know? uh, Bridge is uh, boy. Yeah, that's those, a work of um, art. Yeah. Cables going both ways. Uh, it's it's just it's yeah. So okay, one of the reasons I teach this book every year is that I'm always trying to encourage my students to write about something that is real. And by real, I mean you know not spin, not the billionaire who bought the apartment, that kind of thing, but actually the making of things. And this is a terrific example of you know dogged reporting, the making of things. And one of the points I make is that. You were rebuffed by your editor at the Times, and, and you went and did this on your own on weekends. Yeah. Can well, you talk about what that a bit? motivated, I already gave you part of my motivation, the kinship with tailoring and the making of a bridge. But also, having lived some years in New York before I started researching this book about the Verrazano, I did look, as we all do, at the beauty of the Brooklyn Bridge. 
and, and while I've done a lot of research as a young reporter, history of New York and people who shaped the character of the city, I never could find who did the work on the Brooklyn Bridge. We knew that there were the Roebling brothers, father and son. The only names that I think are associated with that work from the Civil War period. And I wondered, here, this new, this about to be, th this bridge that under construction, the Verzano Bridge, beginning in early 1960s, uh, I will have a chance by going out there to get the names and get to know the people who are doing the labor, the hand, the handwork, unlike the Brooklyn Bridge. No one did it, or they didn't even do it on the, on the, on the uh, George Washington Bridge, which was built during the 1930s. And the same designer of the, of, the, of the George Washington is the same designer here, a much older man. I met him, Mr. Mr. Amon, O-H-M, O-H Amon. I met him, he lived at the Carla Hotel. But I also met and relished in the opportunity to get to know the guys who did the work, the hard hats you see, like this picture back here, him and all these other people. He was only 19, and, and this guy fell off. He didn't tell you, but they had nets, but he fell twice off this bridge. And he was lucky uh, that there were nets. Tell us just before we get, tell us the two, not to, don't take all night, but tell us I won't. How, how, <laughs> how you fell, and what you, you fell two times. And about the nets, why were the nets there? Well, that, that, you have to talk about the strike. Uh, let me, there, was, there were no nets. And there's a reach, there are a couple of deaths, and I wrote about, in this book, about one of them, one of the persons that fell and died hitting the water. And there was the, the labor union, Robert, it's a labor union now, he's the boss of the, of the lo local 40. But before him, there was another guy that had his job named Ray Corbett. And, and he had wanted some nets, he, because there had three deaths already on this bridge, one in 62, one in 63. And finally, there was a strike. I think he'll say f almost a week there was a strike. And finally, they got the nets. Fortunately, this young man, 19 years old or whatever he was, uh, fell into those nets on two occasions. Now, what was the first and what was the second occasion? Actually, what happened was uh, there was a fellow by the name of Ray Corbett that had my job back in the, the late 50s. And he lasted a long time because he was a great labor leader. He was there until the early 90s, and he passed and away. And was a young man? He was on the Empire State Building. He worked on the antenna with his, uh, with his father yeah. on, up on top of the spire, on top of the Empire State Building. But anyway, he was, like I said, he was a terrific labor leader. He was head of the New York State AFL-CIO as well. But at the time, he was business manager of Iron Workers Local 40. And we shared the jurisdiction of the bridge with the Brooklyn Local, Local 361. And uh, those horrible accidents, uh, d uh, the union demanded that they put up safety nets. Well, the contractor wasn't too involved and uh, too interested in putting up the, uh, the safety nets. They thought it was a waste of time and everything like that, you know. And an also but impediment to the raising of steel. With these uh, yeah, yeah. They said it would stop the production and everything like that. So anyway, the union got together, uh, uh, Ray Corbett, and he... Uh, got an engineering firm and he asked them to design something where they could put up safety nets in case somebody fell from the bridge. So there was actually three or four of us that uh, fell into the nets afterwards. I fell once in, into the nets and another time I fell on an inspection's cat, uh, inspector's catwalk, which that one hurt because uh, I landed on some steel across my chest. But I'm here to tell a story and thank God about that. If the, the safety nets weren't there, I wouldn't be here today. I, I, I'd be up, I was up about 240 feet at the time, so. And what uh, was it that, that uh, why did you fall? Was it wind, was it a slip? Uh, no, I was probably too ambitious at the time, Rob, I'll be honest with you. I was an apprentice there and you had to be out feeding the journeyman all the bolts and the pins and everything like that to do the bolting up of the connections of the cord, uh, what they call, it's like a, you would probably think it was a truss but it's all trusses that are made up and they call that a cord. It's a section of the steel, a section of the roadway. And um, these, they'd have fellas at certain points, they'd be bolting all the connections up and I'd have to be bringing out the bolts and the washers and nuts and everything like that and leave it down on top of the cord in different locations. But uh, on top of the cord, they had these cross beams and they were probably about four and a half to five feet apart. So what I used to do is I'd carry these baskets, and they'd probably be 60, uh, 45 to 60 pounds weight in them, and I'd jump from one beam to the other. That's what I was doing. <laughs> kind of foolish, I suppose, uh, but at that time, I was just trying to do my best out there. And uh, 
I just happened to miss my step one time and I landed in the net and thank God the net was there. Like I said, I wouldn't be here today. I, I know I was once a... Oh, I just, um, you know, just very, you know, do you remember this guy? Do you remember back when you were 19, do you remember this guy in a suit? Uh, no, I don't think, well, I don't think I ever talked to Robert, to Robert back then. No, I, I no. might have seen him, but I didn't, didn't, didn't I, didn't, I, I, I did get to know uh, about 20 iron workers pretty well. And one time I met, you mentioned, you mentioned this guy that was a, a, an Indian. Buddy from, Warren. Buddy Warren. I knew him, but I knew another guy. I met him at the Wigwam Bar in Brooklyn, which I don't know if it's there anymore. It's where all the Indians would associate to drink <coughs> after. They weren't supposed to drink in the job. the fire water. Boy, they sure did. Uh, and one time, this guy um, said, would you like to come to the reservation some weekend? Every weekend, they went up to this place about somewhere in the St. Lawrence River. I, I think it's about an eight-hour drive. I'm not sure. But the, at the way they went with their cars, they made an eight-hour drive, a four-hour drive. They're going 100 miles an hour, and, and not without imbibing. As they pedaled away, uh, as they sped away, they were drinking while they were driving, but it seemed to get the car to move faster, for sure. <laughs> and I spent a weekend with those guys, and, the, and, and, and it was like they were committed as much as any iron worker. They were bonded with those who were not Indians. When they came from the reservation on, on early Sunday morning to join the gang on Monday, they were, they were iron workers, they weren't Indians. Every, there's such a great eclectic gathering of these people. There are so many people who are from uh, Irish, like the Walsh family, and there's some Italians. One of the guys I remember, I knew Eddie Ionelli, he was the son of an iron worker, and he had a friend uh, who fell off the bridge. This is before the Nets. And I remember this guy, I know he's a little guy, and the guy was Gerald McKee was the big guy. Young, young, 19 or 20, Gerald McKee. And he was, had brothers on the bridge, the father who was an iron worker. This, this family thing goes deeply and crosses so many generations of so many people who are committed to iron work and building things that last, etc. This guy, Gerald McKee, fell, and the little iron element was trying to hold on his fingers, and he couldn't do it. One of the fingers was broken because he had a he had a stitch from a previous iron job that ruined a finger. So this guy fa falls all the way, about 400 feet, and when you hit the water, it's concrete at that at that height. The guy never survived. But it was so these people have these memories of of success in a way when a job is beautifully completed, and failure when somebody falls and they can't save them. It's I think it's like going to war in a way. I mentioned this once. That like every bridge project is, is like a battle. I mean, it has its, its moments of, of, of exhilaration and it has its moments of tragedy. And it always has the sense of kinship and camaraderie associated with all these people who are sharing the burden of trying to do the job well and at the same time stay alive. Some of them survive battles. I see survive thanks to the Nets. And some of them don't, like, like Gerald McKee. But what a life they live. And Gay, gay um, that's, a, that's, a, that's so great, that, that, that um, comparison and, uh, of war. And, and the chapter you mentioned about driving up to the Indian Reservation, um, that was a, that's a great chapter in the book. It's just a really great chapter. And, and I remember so vividly your description of, the, of, of going 120 miles an hour. And um, you never say in that chapter, you never say, I was scared to death. Uh, yeah, you, you never, he never says that. It's always, he, he never, insert, it's, a, it's really a craft question, I guess. Uh, Jay would want to say that to the Indians in the car, yeah. that's for sure. No, uh, I mean, well, did you, you, you when you were... Feel, when you're with people who have great confidence, <laughs> these Indians... So you weren't scared to death. Were you scared to death? No, I wasn't. Be, they had great, there was no doubt in their minds that they were going to go they're, where they're, they wanted going to go to on their own terms, <laughs> at their own speed, and they're going to make it safely. They, if you were f afraid... You wouldn't do this work, yeah. this crazy work of being up there four or five hundred, and walking on sometimes, uh, uh, walking on a beam that's like 14 inches. I don't know what it is. It's not more than a, not more than two feet, is it? A beam? No, some of them are six or four inches at sometimes. Yeah, some well of these the guys walk like across yeah. these things as if as if they're walking on a boardwalk at Lang City. Well, get, get to, to extend the metaphor. So if the, if this is like a battle, 
and uh, there are troops and there are, there are different yeah. levels there. You're like a war correspondent in this. What, what, describe yeah. what the reporting is. What is the texture of the reporting on something like this? You're not going around, you don't use the tape recorders, you're obviously not going around interviewing no. people with that. How, well, what did it look like? What would I have seen if I was watching well, you report It's like this? they used to term like being embedded with the troops. Um, I was embedded in a, in a way I was. I, I had, first of all, to have permission uh, well, the American Bridge Company gave me permission. I also wore this, I, I was dressed with my three-piece suit. I didn't change to go talk to the iron workers. I dressed with this, but I did have a helmet. I still have it, this, a, this, this hard hat. And I went out there. We'd and, call and, him a suit and tie guy when, we, <laughs> when he'd be approaching someone. And I wanted to know these people. I told you the ambition was to get the names of those people who left their fingerprints on the steel of Verts on a bridge, as had not been the case more than 100 years before with the Brooklyn Bridge. So I wanted to get to know these people. And sometimes I would just hang around and watch them. And during their break for lunch, or maybe when the work day was over, I would hang around and go to the bars with them. And, 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 on a, and sometimes they'd get their addresses, and they would invite me to their homes on weekends. Many of these people who lived in Brooklyn or Staten Island or, or, or the Bronx, as, as the Walsh family is from, I would get their dresses and they would be able to go to their houses and I'd see them during a weekend and I'd get to meet their wives and get to meet to see their children and, and get to know how they lived and, and what they did during their off hours. But what they really did during their off hours was think what it's like to be on hours. They were so committed to this kind of work and, and while they were family men, they really were in their element when they were with working men like themselves. There was this strong bond. I mean, I bet people who are dancers have it, or people who are baseball players. You know, base, base play travel from, with the team, and they're committed to the game of baseball. And their whole life in the off season is rather boring, and they're waiting for the spring train. It's like this, soldiers or athletes. The, the iron worker is athletic. You have to walk on those beams. You have to be... You have to be, have balance, you have to have courage, you have to have almost a fearlessness, like those Indians driving those cars at great, great speeds, and a sense of optimism. You're not gonna fall. If you think you're gonna fall, you're gonna fall, I guess. So these were a different kind of person that I wanted to know and know well enough to, to write with, with accuracy and, and a sense of knowing in my final work with prose. And they're, they're, they're around today. I mean, I know some of these young guys who are 24, 25, 26, who are still doing the kind of work that Robert Walsh, 18, 19 years of age, and this, he is back here, and now he's a 70-year-old labor leader who's trying to find work all the time for people who are 18, 19 apprentices as he was, was once an apprentice. Okay, and another part of the book, some of the chapters that is so fascinating is, and, and as anyone who's driven over the Verrazano Bridge knows, it cuts this wide swath right through Bay Ridge and uh, where there were at one time houses, businesses, other things like that. And, and you, know, you tell these fantastic stories of all the people who were displaced, which is not usually a story one hears in a, in yeah. a, in a book about progress. Well, well before, before a bridge is built or any great project, there's these, the, the land has to be acquired, and the approach ways to a bridge require a lot of land being acquired. And sometimes, as the case of the Brooklyn part of Brooklyn called Bay Ridge, the Bay Ridge area was right in the area that the bridge had to have an approach way. And so these people were told in no uncertain terms, they're gonna have to give up their homes. And they, all the lawsuits aside, they were gonna have to give up their homes. And so they did so with great anger and, and remorse, as you could imagine. And I thought that these homes that would be demolished, it was like people, again, in times of war. I mean, these homes are gonna be destroyed, and they were destroyed. The bulldozers and clan moving equipment and everything finally paved over. And, um, and they had to be displaced, as people do when their areas are destroyed. No matter where you're in the war, wherever the war, people are gonna have to move forcibly. Their homes are destroyed and they have to rebuild if they survive the, the process. And that's what these people had to so do. So how did you report that? Did you just wander around while yeah, they, while Yeah, I interviewed was the same way. I believe the kind of work I do, it's, it's sort of hands-on, just like Robert Walsh and all those other iron workers' jobs are. It's hands-on. And mine is, is, is hanging out with people, 
getting to know them face to face, getting to know them so well, and getting a, a trust. My sincere interest is in what they do, why they do it, how they do it. It's, I don't care if I'm talking to iron workers or baseball players or somebody who dances with the, with, with, with the ballet company or somebody who does something else. A high wire walker in a circus could be the same thing. How they do it, why they do it. This, I mean, this is a question, I guess, for really for Alex. Is you know, one of the things that's that really distinguishes Gay's book from other books on infrastructure as such is that it is, as as he was just saying, it's really the story of the people who built it. It's the human history, really, it was of the New York Times, was of the mafia, was of all those sorts of things. Is there a, a role for that kind of writing about infrastructure, about work, about? Building that that ca that goes on now in the kind of journalism you do and that you care so much about. Well, yeah, it's, yes, very much, and I think that's why it's a great book because it it it, it is about the people that that built the bridge and are affected by the bridge, but it's also about the bridge. I mean, it also gives uh, a really good sense of how the bridge is built, and and it gives some to the extent it can in 1964. It gives some extent of what the bridge will do, and and. I, I guess uh, one question that occurs to me in, in reading the book is, um, I mean, I think I love writing and thinking about infrastructure in terms of bridges because, you know, it's not just a physical thing. It's, it's about, uh, t to me, great infrastructure projects, they're, they're usually aspirational is the word that comes to me. They're, they're usually, they're, they're a vision of a people. It's not just where you want to go, it's where, who you want to be. You know, when you build a great bridge or a subway, Usually, uh, there, there's there's a vision. There's a vision in mind, and uh, now the the Verrazano Bridge is uh, has been in, of recent years much criticized as 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 sort of a, a faulty vision, as a, you know that that the the homes destroyed, the uh, the uh, kind of overly car oriented uh, suburbanizing Staten Island, right or wrong. It's 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 and, and and as an example of the overly imperious philosophy of Robert Moses, who who sort of was kind of single-minded and not, not real subtle in his projects. And um, I guess one question to both of you is, is to do, when you're building a bridge, does, does the vision of the bridge, uh, is that, is that do, you, do you feel a sense of that? You know, the, the sense of what is the vision that, that we're, the aspiration that, that, we're, that we're going for here? And well, I think, uh, you know, it's hard to stop progress anymore. It really is. Mm -hmm. um, you know, like a, a fella came up to us earlier during the night and he started talking about a pedestrian way and a bike yeah, way. That, that's that's one of the, the things we've discussed you know? now, yeah. You know, it'll probably eventually come. Mm -hmm. You know, it really will. Just like those people that were displaced in Bray Ridge. I'd say the majority of those people are living in Staten Island now. Yeah, yeah. yeah Staten yeah. Island, when I used to travel from the bridge, we used to go through all of Staten Island when we had a car. Uh, in the beginning, I didn't have a car. I, was, I used to take the subway down to uh, the Battery Park there and get the Staten Island Ferry, go across to Bay Street at the slip there, get a bus and go out to the, out to, uh, to the bridge. That was a hike, let me tell you. <laughs> Four o'clock in the morning, you had to get up. I'm not kidding. But it was a hike. But, uh, and you'd start at 8 o'clock in the morning. So that was part of my day anyway, the start of it. Then I got involved with a couple of fellows that lived in the Bronx and they used to share their cars, and we'd give so much towards the gas and the travel there. And we traveled through Staten Island. Staten Island was only farmland at the yeah. time. It really was. That's all that was there. Yeah. And like I said, I think the majority of those people that were displaced are, are living I in Staten Island. I can, I can believe that. And, and Gay, I guess to continue the war metaphor, can you write not only about what it's like to be in the war or the battle, but whether it's a good war, you know, whether, it, whether it's a worthy endeavor? Well, the, the benefits, one comments, oh, it's a great benefit to have this bridge. Robert makes reference to the time when Staten Island was farmland. And you become very nostalgic and romantic about this. Oh, it was a farmland. It wasn't that with these damn cars going by, and the pollution, all the aggravation, the noise. Well, those people who were opposed to the bridge lost that war. Their protests aside, Robert Moses won the war. He kicked out these people, destroyed these homes, 
paved the way. They built these turnstiles, and every day I think a million dollars is collected yeah. on the bridge. I'm not, I think that's about accurate. Every day the bridge makes a million bucks from these cars going back and forth. Is that bring, I think that's, well, that's 915,000 bucks a yeah, hop. Yeah, <laughs> so a million bucks. MTA gets richer every day by the people driving back and forth, driving by. It must cost $15, I think. I don't uh, remember what it costs, but I think it's about 15 bucks yeah. to go across that bridge. So you can see a million bucks, not bad every day. But is it great? Well, the economy, people who are in Staten Island didn't want to be farmers, wanted to be part of New York and maybe entrepreneurial in spirit, be part of the entrepreneurial spirit of New York, are brought closer to the boroughs such as Brooklyn and Manhattan by virtue of that bridge. I'm sure dramatic going on the ferry back and forth, but Staten Island became part of New York. It became truly part of the boroughs of the larger city of New York by, by being linked to the larger lifestyle, not farming, not agrarian, but the larger lifestyle and the possibilities of enhancing your life through commerce because of that bridge. In that sense, I guess if you were interested in being other than a farmer, then I think the bridge rings as a triumph. If you are wanting to live the isolated life as if you're living somewhere in faraway Vermont, then I guess Staten Island was ruined by the bridge. Well, I, mean, I still I, think there's a, there's a but I, 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 I still think Staten Island is, is still has its look that, we, that you would have found familiar when you were a 19 year old apprentice. I mean, it's not completely ruined. No, in certain areas, it still has farmland there. Yeah, cer yeah. certainly has. Yeah, I mean, you really... It, it one Central Park was farmland. Yeah. You know, there were, there were Sheep's Meadow. There was one before the Armstrong, the crazy Armstrong. What's the name? Who's the... Uh, Pamela, what's... The Olmstead. Olmstead. Uh, he was like a Robert Moses probably then. I mean, probably... <laughs> he wasn't... He, he was an idealist. He was... Uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Anyway. But anyway. I, I, what I'm curious about is, is this... I mean, I, it's clear how this project fit into your larger vision of what it is to be a journalist and your interest in you know, craftsmanship and all those things. As you've looked around, do you see other projects? Have, have you, in your career, have you thought about other projects that, that, would, that would, would warrant this kind sure. of treatment as well? If people, it's a, it was a people story, the bridge. I mean, I could, I once tried, uh, but I was kicked off the job. I wanted to, in, to live in the, Brooklyn, in the um, Metropolitan Opera House. Uh, and I did for a while, about four years ago. I got temporary permission from Peter Gelb, who's still the, the um, director, the general director of the, of the Metropolitan, and I wanted to write about all the stories that are behind the opera, behind the music, the people who design the clothes, the people who design the lighting, the people who built the furniture, the people who provided the animals that sometimes you see in operas. And I remember in, I saw an opera, War and Peace, and they had horses, uh, Napoleon riding a horse as a, in part of that, and sheep and goats and everything. You've seen, well, they're animal trainers, and they're, all these various crafts are within the Metropolitan Opera House in, in Lincoln Center. And uh, of course, there was a, I saw a little perfect, uh, there's a, behind the stage, below the, below the stage, uh, n near the, near the where, where the orchestra is assembled, there's a prompter, somebody who sits through the opera, none of us see, but they are facing the singers, and if the singer seems to pause and not know, this person will, in a way that they hear but we don't hear, they, they pick up what they forgot in terms of, of the aria or whatever they were singing. A person who does that night after night, a prompter, I mean, just wonderful characters. But then, uh, so I th that's a story I'd like to have done. I would still like to do that story. It'd be a wonderful book. Be a wonderful book because you have an opera stage and you have behind the stage other, st other, other scenes that are not part of what you see when you see scenery in an opera. I don't want to dwell on why I didn't do it, but I didn't do it because I got kicked out. 
And the reason I got kicked out is because I didn't want to sign a document that would have meant I'd have to submit what I wrote to the director for his approval, and that's, that, that kills the story faster than anything else. That's what happened. But I can see stories all over. I mean, there's, there's so many stories in New York. You don't even have to leave this neighborhood. You could find stories. One, one, one thing uh, Bob and I talked with about uh, today on the phone was that uh, the kind of access you had was un unbelievable. Yeah. And really, post 9-11, the ability to wander around and wander into places like this uh, has really been diminished, and it's re really one of the tragic, one of the many tragic outcomes from that day. And I was sort of wondering, could you imagine, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, one of my students coming and writing about one of your projects that one of the that your workers are working on? That uh, would that ever be something that could get cleared, that could get done? That the yeah, next that generation they would let them wander them? around, uh, to sort of. Well, you know, I'm sure when you come in downstairs, you notice the security fellow there. That fellow probably was not there before one. And ever yeah. since then, time has completely changed. It really has changed a lot of people's lives. Um, to get on jobs now, you just can't walk into a job anymore today. You have to have ID, your pass card, all sorts of requirements, safety requirements. You have to have taken in school, apprentice school. But it's extremely hard to get on a job site today. I've had numerous people call me from all over the world. I mean all over the world to see if I could be put uh, on, they could be put on top of the, uh, the World Trade Center site, uh, but, Trade Center One. But I will bet if one of Bob, Bob's students went to your offices, offices on Park Avenue South, 33rd Street, what, 31st Street? Park Between Avenue 30th and 31st. It's the Ray Corbett building, and this young lady here that is, is, is the secretary in that building is the granddaughter of Ray Corbett, is that right? Yes, she She's is. She's the yeah. granddaughter. Ray yeah. Corbett was the guy that went on top of the Empire State Building and became the, had the job that J J uh, Robert Walsh has t t today. But I will bet if, if one of your students went over to see Robert Walsh at the office and wanted to, um, wanted to go to watch how these uh, uh, apprentices learn safety, there, there's a, they have a teacher. I think it's in Queens somewhere, I don't know, yeah, Brooklyn. Yeah, it's our apprentice school. It's a three-year right, apprentice, apprentice school. school. Yeah. I never went there, but I thought, I thought that'd be a story. It's an apprentice school. You have a guy who teaches courses, correct? Oh, we have uh, probably about 12 teachers that teach. And they teach you. They teach apprentices, right? Yeah, that's what they and do. And they teach yeah. them what? How to climb up uh, things? They've got to climb columns that are inside the building. I think that'd be a good, good a teacher full story. A full-year well register. And the basics of the, of the iron working business. That'd be, uh, be, be our international pays millions of dollars each year for training our apprentices. You know, and and how so how people don't know. You would give permission for that, wouldn't you? Yeah, I would, sure. yes. That's an easy assignment right there. Uh, Gay would be a good city editor. <laughs> How long does the training take? Do you get a certificate or what? What's it's, it's a three-year course. Okay. Yeah, two of the practical parts of the business and one year at welding. And if you don't pass the welding test, well, you're not going to get your card, your journeyman card, after three years. And then you have to take a test by. It's like it's like boot camp. It's like you fail out of an air, or like like you want to be a pilot and you don't make it, or you want to be a marine and you don't. Whatever. Isn't this sort of like that? Well, you try to do that because it's kind of hard today when you have a bunch of young guys in a class that uh, might stop off after work for something <laughs> and uh, go to school, you know. You gotta be like a DI, a drill instructor sometimes with some of these guys that are in school, really. Hmm. Yeah. Any questions, you want any questions for your audience? Yeah, no. absolutely. They so might be bored but what we're saying and they're too polite to leave. Why don't we, uh, uh, hold on a second, James, we'd like to uh, record this so if uh, we can activate the mic, that would be great. Uh, you've got the mic. Terrific, even better. So yes, absolutely. So, some questions for anyone here. Yes, can you just wait for James? Well, we pitch the question so you can hear it. Okay. Hi, uh, you were talking about the designing of the safety nets and how, how the union arranged for those to be designed and... With an engineering firm they with got. With an engineering firm. And they paid for it themselves. Right, I was wondering how the funding, it how you got the funding together. It came from together. the union itself. Okay, so it was from your dues. That's how they paid the engineering firm, you, yeah. Okay, thanks. And they finally got it and it worked. Like I said, anything can be done, you know. Just like the future, the walkway, the bikeway. That'll come sooner or later. Yeah, Thank you. other questions? Yeah, could you? Uh,
yeah, that'd be great if you could just come up. Thank you. Um, in the beginning, Mr. Walsh, you talked about um, how uh, building was much more labor intensive and there was, you know, there were so many men putting their actual hands on the building and now there are all these innovations that make it a little bit easier uh, for building. And Mr. Talese, I'm wondering if you see similar uh, similar similarities in the field of journalism uh, in terms of <coughs> labor, uh, these new tools that we have in journalism. Well, if um I'll let, ask Mr. Walsh to explain what the difference is uh, from his youthful days to what he sees among the youth in the ironworking business. But in my business, the people who, who do what I do, I can find some of them 19, or I, mean, I can find some of them in their 20s. But in order to to do what I do and what Robert Caro does and what the late David Halberstam does and <clears throat> many people whose work is, is respected and long lasting in its, in its value have to take a lot of time. And the tools that people use today are time saving tools. The emphasis is on, on doing, doing something with ease and with speed and getting results that aren't time consuming. That's contrary to what I practice and the people I respect practice. I believe there's no way to avoid taking your time to do a good job. So I do not carry any of the tools. I don't even have a cell phone. I never, I don't want to talk to people. I want to see them. And when I, I remember when I was a young reporter, a young guy, I was a, I was a copy boy. I started off in journalism as a copy boy. I was a servant, I was an intern. And I worked at the New York Times for about a year. And I, was, I started in 1953. I just got out of college the same year. And one of the first things I remember is an old time reporter told me, he said, kid, never use a telephone. Never, the, the telephone in those days was the new technology. Never use a telephone. Always go see people in person. Why? So if you could, could you get something from their faces, their expressions, the gestures, where they, the setting. You have to see them, and you say, that's absolutely right. I do that. I mean, oh, I don't care. I mean, I had to go to the bridge. I had to meet these people in person. I had to and, and hope that they would be willing to let me go to their homes, because I wanted to see the full picture, you know? Now, I, I don't know whether the 19-year-old the Robert Walsh's of today are, are like he imagined he was when he was 19, but maybe tell us, are these guys like you? Well, you were talking about change, what things have changed. I'll just give you an example on high-rise buildings now. They used to have plank gangs, and what I mean by that is when you set two floors of steel, you would have to plank it, and the planks were 24 feet long, two inches thick and about a foot wide. So you had one journeyman on each end of the plank and they'd lay the plank down so you could work on that floor. Then when that, all the floor was planked over, you'd have to put four by fours down and you would hoist the steel from the street, land it in certain areas on top of the four by fours. It would all come up in a big bundle of steel and you'd have to shake it out, what they call shaking out. You'd be separating the pieces of steel you try to put it in this section here, that section over there, because that one mightn't go over here. They'd be all numbered and everything like that. The plank job is gone now for decking. What they put down is steel decking now. So those jobs are gone. Also, uh, with the new cranes, I said before, like Guy Derrick's, there was very labor-intensive work. With these new cranes today, they jump themselves on a tower. Uh, there's one man less in the gang now because you didn't have to turn the guy Derek around. You had to turn the guy Derek around. This you don't have to turn around. But that's some of the ways they've saved money and you know, there's less members working also. But would you tell, uh, I would like him to tell you a story. I think you'll find it interesting. He mentioned 9-11, he mentioned security. I said that some of the people who finished the job in the Verizon in 1964 or even before went to other jobs. He went to the World, uh, World's Fair, I think. Some of the guys I knew went to the World Trade Center and built that. Sorry. 
Then after the d destruction of 2001, I still keep in touch with these people. And one of the guys, I remember his name was Edward Ionelli. He's the guy, I remember the guy that tried to hold on to this fellow and, and he couldn't. That same guy, I was, became a great friend of Edward Ionelli. And he told me he worked on the, on the first World Trade Center. He and others like him, many of, the, of his friends. And he said when he was doing that job, he was so appalled by the cheap, thin steel that was, that was put into the World Trade Center beginning in 1964, 65, I don't know, whenever they started that, compared to what he had seen in the Verrazano Bridge and what he, but then he and people like him were working on the World Trade Center. They were appalled. Of course, they had no, they just followed the rules. So this was the designer and the engineer and that's all. Then jumped to 2001. The building just destroyed in about four hours. It was big, one big heap of ash. And, and he said, I wasn't surprised. None of us were surprised. None of us. Because this is a piece of junk. He said, this thing, this, these world, it was like bird cage. It was like, it was like, a, it was like a, a, a big bird cage, big steel, thin. And I told us the, the other day to Robert Walsh here. And you, know, you agreed with me, didn't you? Yeah, I agreed because it wasn't the standard structural steel building. The majority of the steel that was in the, it was in the core, the elevator shaft, uh, that's where all the heavy steel was. Some of those columns were 70 ton in the, in the elevator core because they went up and everything came off of that to the outside what we call trees. They, the sections of the columns would come up and they were like this, there were four, and they'd sit on top of one another and it would keep going up just like that. And from the columns into the core was bar joists, what they call it, light angles and, and round steel bars. And th there'd be a bunch of these uh, uh, steel frames, and the decking was sitting on top of it. It wasn't steel beams at all, you know. And actually, when we got word of the, uh, the airplane hitting the uh, Trade Center one, uh, we ran upstairs to see uh, in our fund office. Uh, the television in the uh, uh, in our room up there. We have a room with a big television, and we were sitting there. There was four or five of us sitting there, and after uh, about 20 minutes, I said, "Gee, I wonder what the structure, how the structural integrity is going to be in this building." Like you know, and gee, only a few minutes later, the damn building came down. We were, I'll tell you, we we're all crying, looking at it. I'll be honest. Yeah, with you. but part but of it I though, mean, it was just that it was. Yeah. They had their own rules, the Port Authority. You know. Uh, you can't do anything down there with the police or anything. They have their own police. They have their own fire codes and everything like that. It wasn't a regular building where the fire codes have to be approved by the, the, the buildings, buildings department. But what uh, motivated that building was, was commerce. They wanted to build as much floor, readable floor space. They didn't want steel to be in the way. They wanted to make as most, most money they could per square yard. That, now this new building, is I heard from iron workers, is very different. This new uh, is a very strong building. Tell them how that is different. Well, like so there's a concrete core. One, whatever it's called. Yeah, a, a, a concrete core going up inside it also, which is a lot heavier as well. Uh, what happens is when you get so much heat around concrete or steel, the concrete would explode and it would expose the rods to more heat and you'd lose all your strength in the building. The same thing in steel if it's that hot, but the regular steel beams, if it was used like in the World Trade Center, like it was in Tower One here now, the, the New Trade Center One, now I don't know if it's gonna happen that, hopefully we'll never see it, you know, but we never expected what happened anyway, let's be honest. Nobody ever expected something like that in O one. Other questions? Can you uh, uh, give it to Amanda? Thank you. Mr. Talese, I was wondering, uh, when you first started reporting on the Verrazano Bridge, what did you think you were going to be writing about, and how did that change as your reporting progressed? Well, um, when I, I knew they were going to build a bridge, I often wondered, <clears throat> I knew, we certainly know how you build a tower, it's like how you build a skyscraper, but I wonder, how does the, how do they build the, the horizontal section of a bridge? I mean, how do they go from one tower in Brooklyn, and then they get over to Staten Island. It's two and a half miles between these two towers. How in the hell do they build this roadway that finally will be filled with trucks and cars morning into the night? How do they do it? And I remember, 
I read somewhere that the old Indians, when they build little bridges, little rope bridges, they'd get a bow and arrow and shoot the arrow across from one little, over a lake or over, and then they'd keep shooting arrows and they'd, they'd have the cable done that way. Shoot, shoot, shoot. Well, this was, you couldn't do this a bow and arrow shooting from Brooklyn and Staten Island, it's two and a half miles. But these, these what Bob uh, Walsh was telling about these wheels that you see, they were the, like the bow and arrow. The wheels go here and there. They both the, First of all, the cable is small and it's bigger and bigger and bigger and the wheels go back and forth like spiders and they just finally have so much cable that it can be later on tied up together and become strong enough to hold up the steel. But I was interested in how you build the horizontal aspect of a bridge. Curiosity. But I also didn't want to write a technical book. I wasn't writing a book about engineering. I talked to engineers. And I talked to the great designer himself, the guy that did the, they did the George Washington as well, and other bridges around here. That little, and that little road bridge, and that green bridge, uh, that walk over there in the 88th Street, isn't it? He did the same thing, that little. And Gay, I thought a great part of the book was where you talked about the, um, uh, the perilous nature of being a bridge designer, that, that basically uh, one bad bridge oh, yeah. will end your career. And uh, true. that made it, made, it, made it human. Could you talk just a, a bit about that? Yes, the, um, I, I don't remember the name of the designer, but the designer of the famous, that, that galloping Gertie, what was it? Oh, where is that in the, in the state of Washington? I don't remember the, the name, it's in my book. I forgot. His was his ruined. His just whole career is just destroyed. Oh, um, and there. Go, go ahead. Could you pass it on to maybe this gentleman? I agree that uh, bridges are magnificent structures, particularly Verrazano. But you know, there have also been books about other infrastructure like subways, and there are some amazing infrastructure projects going on right now in the city, like the Long Island Railroad access to the east side and the Second Avenue subway. Why do you think uh, the books about the, those kinds of infrastructure projects aren't quite as sexy? I mean, I don't see anyone writing those books right now. You know, I've I've written a few articles about those, uh, and so far, but you know, they, they've 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 not had the readership of uh, Gay Tilly's. Uh, you, you know, um, I, I think you need a great a great writer, a great reporter. It ha the circumstances have to be right, and you know, maybe maybe one of those will maybe there are still a great book to be written about those projects. Um, I was I was down underground where the Second Avenue subway is, and it is it is amazing down there. It it, it you know you you go down this. Uh, Elevator, of, I think about 15 stories, and suddenly you're in this other world of uh, of cavernous spaces and the sand hogs working. And um, but I, but I think you have to connect the project to um, <coughs> somehow tell the story of the project, but to put to connect it to something larger. And uh, but yeah, so yeah, that I mean, would be a great story though if you'd have built. I mean, I once when I was a reporter in the Times and did little features that took me maybe a day or two at most. And I remember once I wrote a, a piece about the man who was in charge of polishing the tile in the Lincoln Tunnel. And I remember I went back, he started working at four in the morning and he worked in a sort of a vehicle contraption that, that linked to the side of the side of, the t of one side of the tunnel. And he kind of, it was like a great windshield wiper. And he just, from one side of the tunnel, and he just polished this thing and went back and forth and back and forth. And it was, f I thought, how in the hell was this tunnel ever built? I never did the research, but just to think that the Lincoln Tunnel, the Holland Tunnel, which we go through sometimes without giving thought to how it was first constructed, the number of mistakes that were made in the construction, the number of people who probably were dead or, 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 or harmed. I mean, is you could go the history of tunnels. I mean, if you really want to do this, if you want to do this, this is a good story in tunnels. It really is. Actually, I worked in a, uh, a tunnel. We did the shaft, the steel in the shaft up on the, in High Bridge, up in, uh, above the uh, McCombs Dam Bridge there. And uh, you had to go down about 600 feet. And in the very beginning, before the, you had the elevator made, they just used a cable 
And uh, I don't know, some of you people might remember you seen in, in parts of Africa where they were stewing people in this big tub, you know, just boiling them up. Well, that's what it was like. You had to jump into this big pot. And uh, there was probably about 15 people in the pot. And you went down this shaft and went down about 600 feet. It was amazing, I'll be honest with you. You know, it's constantly raining all the time from the water that's seeping through the rock. But it's, uh, it's, it's quite amazing. It really is a tunnel job as well. And I'm sure there will be someday. I've seen documentaries on television already about them. Thank you. Uh, I don't need the mic, sorry, I'll just talk loud. <laughs> uh, this is addressed to, to all of you. Uh, you believe that infrastructure projects uh, have gotten out of the mind of the general project, the general large scale urban infrastructure projects, whether they be bridges, subways, tunnels, highways. Do you believe that that has disappeared out of the mind of the public more so than it used to be? Back when you were reporting uh, in the Times 50 years ago, was it more common in people's minds? And if that's the case, I'll take a stab at it. But I mean, I, I think you know, it's, it's sort of. We, I think we're doing less great infrastructure projects than we used to, and there's a lot of lamenting about that among people who like infrastructure. I mean, the, the Second Avenue subway is, is a, you know, is a is a little piece of of one, but uh, we don't have sort of a maglev train being built or. And uh, yeah, so that you know, you look to China or to Europe or to uh, the, uh, you know, these, like the Great Bridge from Sweden to uh, 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 yeah, Mal the Malmo Bridge and um, uh, the Channel. Uh, so you know, have we lost our heart or um, or are we just sort of being uh, uh, whatever? But uh, I I think there I think all the, uh, even though I say that there is actually s there seems to be more of a recognition today that what we call infrastructure matters. So there is actually a, I think more public discussion of it than there ever was. Uh, I think it's interesting that it used to be called public works. Infrastructure is actually a very new term. I like I like the term public works. It's 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 a meaty and and it says something. It's work. It's public. You know so. What do you think today, uh, in this, at least in the city of New York, represents the most dramatic example of infrastructure? What, what is going on here? Is it the subway on Second Avenue, or what? Yeah, is it? I think it's the Second Avenue subway. And, is it? Uh, the, and, and, and the is east that, side is that access. taking an unusually long time? It seems it never finishes. But why is it? Why is it taking so uh, long? No, it, it's it's it, and and I think this might be something Robert Walsh would comment on too. It it it, it does seem to be taking. It takes a really long time. It costs a, a really a lot of money, even even compared to places like London and Paris, which have very high labor costs and also a lot of infrastructure to work around. And and I think that is a uh, you know like uh, the place where I'm a senior fellow of the Regional Plan Association. They're examining those questions, but uh, it gets into labor costs, but also gets into environmental review processes. It gets into the legal system. Uh, uh, the, the, it's, it's a very complex question, but the, the, like the way we, the, the laws that regulate, basically our fear of, uh, you know, there, there's, it's, it's, a, it's a thick question. And, uh, yeah. But I, I think but actually, I think people, they do, yeah. As we mentioned before in the, in the history of the Verts on a Bridge, people lost their homes, had to move. Did people lose their homes and have to move for the Second Avenue? Uh, not uh, too much, no, not too much. Why? How come? Uh, well, there, one thing, it's going underneath everything. The, the, the original subways are what they call cut and cover, and they, they had to, uh, they're sort of just a trench in the street, whereas uh, the newer ones, they're, they're way deep, and they have these tunnel boring machines, and uh, so they don't actually have to uh, displace that but many That would have people. been a great story, that whether mm -hmm. this gentleman or any of you who are interested in long-form journalism the story of the Second Avenue subway would have been a terrific story. And if you did it through people, I don't yeah. care what you're writing about, from the history of sewing machines or the history <laughs> of light, you have, if you get characters, then you are writing about people. And what they're doing, of course, is interesting in a special way, but it's a people story. And the Second Avenue subway would be a great people story. Yeah, be finding, find the right people, the right person. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, you've been talking about uh, the book being a uh, story of human beings. You've been talking about uh, looking at things on a human scale. And Mr. Walsh said that the bike pedestrian fan, you will you'll quote, it will come. I'd like to know if any of you have advice for the advocates for the fan. How, oh, how can we help expedite its coming? Keep on bitching. 
That's I the way certainly to do it. intend to. That's the way to do it. You'll get what you want. And I'm not lying. Listen, they talked about this Verrazano Bridge. That bridge in the 1890s, 1920s, it wasn't passed until the 50s. Finally got it. No, it takes a while, that's what I said. You're not gonna get it today or tomorrow, but you keep on doing what I said. So I'm gonna make two comments, we can take some more questions. One is that the book is for sale here at a 20% discount, $30.50. Gorgeous book, fantastic photographs. Uh, another comment to my, uh, my uh, GA, there is, uh, if you look in the freezer in the back, there's soda, if you could take that out before it explodes, and water as well. And there'll be, uh, there's food and drink uh, for afterwards. More questions, I'm sorry. Yes, ma'am. Uh, no, my um, So first of all, uh, Mr. Chavez, I'd like to say I'm here with my high school journalism class, uh, how exciting it is to hear you speak. Um, you spoke uh, towards the beginning of uh, things that, that are built to last um, and, and crack. And I think we live in a world where, like, um, we live in a world where things less and less are built to last, clothes are cheaper, electronics are cheaper. Do you think we're losing anything there? And if so, what is it that we're losing? Well, we made <coughs> one sad example of how the aberrations, as I suggest, was that was inherent in the building of the first World Trade Center, where the emphasis was on the most rentable space. That building was gonna be a commercial success and I guess it would have been if it, even today, if it had survived, it probably was during the period it did survive. But what it did not do was pay attention to the idea of building something with care, with building it as well as it could be built. Something had to give and that the, 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 the tide of, of greed played a big role in how that building was designed. Later through the bad experience, this replacement as Robert Walsh already told us, is built under different standards and the history of disaster from 2001 has now made what we see in its place today more to the highest standards of long-lasting uh, projects. Um, but I'm not sure that I answered a question. The question has to do with journalism, does it not? D is it something you wanted to ask me a little bit? more sharply. <laughs> um, uh, oh, anyway. I suppose, I mean, if, you, if you, one were to direct, to direct the question towards journalism, um, I would ask, uh, do you think the, the cheapening of things in this world has any effect on the way that people write and the way that people uh, investigate well, things? Well, I think that the computer, for example, I use the computer because I have to because in order to write for example, I, I want to do things for the New Yorker. Now, when I started doing things for the New Yorker, which was about three years ago, they said you have to use, you have to email us. You cannot <laughs> type out something and, and then mail it into us. That's what I used to do. I used to write an article, and then I'd type it, and type it, and polish it, and type it, and polish it. Then I'd get 30, 40, or 50 pages, beautifully typed, and I'd get it stamps, and I'd mail it in. No, no, you have to email it. Okay, so I had to learn how to use email. I had to get a computer, and I did, because I had to sell out. I wanted to be the New Yorker, and I had to, and, and, and I, this is probably true of every magazine. All right, but what I do not do, is I told you when I was a kid, the guy said, don't use the telephone. I go to places, and that's something that young journalists, I still think, have to do. They have to go see the people. They have to travel. I mean, sometimes you can't afford it. Sometimes you can't get an expense account that allow you to travel. Well, you don't have to go outside of New York. There, every th New York is the world. Every, every, if you go in a subway any day and you look at the subway car, you have but nine languages being spoken. The people in the subway are probably from 50 countries. The, 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 the internationalism of this city means you, if you just go around the five boroughs, you'll find touches of the world in every manifestation of the people there, the neighbors, the what they, how they think, what they're concerned, they're very different. So I think you don't have to have airplane trips to faraway places. You can explore with depth this city and find such great stories to do, but you have to do them with eye contact. And personally, you can't, 
you can't Google your way through life. You have to, you have to, I think you can't even, you can't even use a telephone, my old boss told me. You have to be there, and that takes time. And what it takes in the beginning is a kind of compatibility or, or, or sympathy to say nothing of good manners to get people to give you time. You have to sincerely be interested in people, not exploiting them, not to get them fast and, ma and make a story fast and sensational and sell it, but rather you have to take a lot of time to try to understand how other people think, try to understand how they get through the day and night, what they do, why they do it, as I said before. And all this involves coming, coming to people with patience and patience and sometimes if you're an educated person, I bet everybody in this room is pretty educated. And they can deal with educated people. And because of the technology, educated people communicate with educated people. And this is kind of a class structure of the educated communicating on the basis of their language and understanding and their shared experiences. And this is true in journalism. Journalism is made up of educated people, similarly educated, all of them. They have a kind of inner world of education. And this is what's ruinous about journalism these days because they do not understand the working class because they don't spend any time with the working class. They don't understand the special needs of special people. They, they, have, they, they come out, journalism today doesn't have people, as was the case when I was young, from the outside. We were outsiders. We were people on the outside looking in. Most of us were not well educated. Or if we were, we were the first generation that got an education. But we weren't people who went to Harvard, Yale, Princeton, we were, n we, we of my generation, meaning the generation of World War II, post-World War II, were the first people in our families who went to college. And we had an outsider's point of view and our curiosity about people. We were looking for people with a kind of wonderment. There was a sense of wonderment. We weren't blasé about anything. I think the new journal, the journalists that, the people who are 30 and 40, 50 years old today are better educated than my group and Halberstam and all those people I knew, better educated in one sense, but not really curious about a world different from their own. And I think the technology of people each day sitting behind a laptop, spending their days c communicating with the technology, and never really seeing people, but sort of seeing the world through the little laptop with a little screen, has a narrowing effect. I think it's not broadening. It's, it's, it's easy, it's fast. It's like putting up the first World Trade Center. It didn't go, it go up and it came down pretty fast. But this kind of mentality where you don't see people but you see their stories through pictures or, or, or looking at that little laptop, that awful little machine. And people sit in their ass all day long and they get to their world, they, th their whole world is a little laptop. This is not, I don't think, for the big vision people. I don't think this is for grand ideas. And good writing, I don't think it is. Good for that. You know, I have a, a quick story, on, a little on point, about how the mail service has changed over the years. Um, Gay, you said you used to mail in your stories. Uh, you probably, I'm sure you remember Lewis Mumford, uh, who was the architecture critic for The New Yorker for a long time. But, but uh, I, I do, in reading a book about him and some work, uh, in the 1930s, he lived in Queens, and he used to uh, correspond with Harold Ross, the editor of The New Yorker. And you, and you read this correspondence, and what becomes apparent is, you know, that back then I think they had two, even three mail deliveries a day. He would write Harold Ross in the morning from Queens. The letter would get to Harold Ross the same day. And then Harold Ross would write back the same day. And, and, and get it to Lewis, I, I think maybe arrive the same day. So it, it was, it, it was it, you know, this is, Amazing correspondence by mail, pre-fax, pre-email, uh, uh, almost unimaginable. Hmm. Are we staying too long? The other professor here. Uh, think? Well, we, I think we have room for time for one more question, that which always kills all questions. Yes. I'll get to the uh, the second part of my question, <laughs> and uh, the second part is uh, directed to the esteemed author. Is there something, uh, with all the gains that we've had since you've come around this world, is there something that you feel we've lost? lost? Something that we've really lost that, uh, that maybe troubles you or disturbs you, uh, and, uh, and what is it and why? 
I have a feeling it might involve a uh, light box. So well, one of the laptop, things I, I think as a journalist, one of the things that happened to journalism as a result of the, of the attack of 2001, bringing with it a renewed sense of patriotism and also a sense of fear about future attacks, vulnerability, all that. It brought to journalism a fear of contradicting the consciousness it fears of being unpatriotic. If the fear of writing or communicating something that would cause a negative reaction among the reading public or the audience of television or radio, a caution has prevailed. Um, the, the caution led us, uh, or, the, or the fear of, of being contrary to the best interests of the country, which the nation's leaders always remind you what's national security or, or concerns for violation of privacy, is what led us into the war in 2003 into invading Iraq. The press did not have any right to say that the government found or was aware of weapons of mass destruction, for example. No one demanded from Secretary of Defense Rumsfeld or Condoleezza Rice, all those people uh, who were part of the administration of the, of the second Mr. Bush in 2003, the press went along with the statement from the Defense Department that they're weapons of mass destruction. So we have that going into, into Iraq. That's how we invaded Iraq in 2003. And what happened then? Then we have the embedded journalists. I mentioned, I used the word embedded before in a different context. But the embedded journalists who started going on these missions in Iraq were getting what the military and what the Defense Department wanted you to get. There was, and remains today with our different uh, wars in Afghanistan or the wishing to get into Syria in a more serious way. There's no journalists that are violating the goodwill of the State Department or the Defense Department. When I was young, when I was young in 1960 or when I was a young reporter in the Times, we had two people, one of my generation and one of an older generation, they're almost driven out of the, out of the they were certainly vile, caused the anger of, of, the, of the United States government. One of them, in 1964, or 1966, named Harrison Salisbury. I don't think anybody in this room ever heard of Harrison Salisbury. If anyone did, I'd be thrilled. But he was the greatest car, foreign correspondent in the New York Times during the time when I was a reporter there. And what made him great was his willingness to confront the nation in the quest of truth and not listening to the, to the propaganda that comes out of the Pentagon or whoever. He went to Hanoi on his own at a time when Hanoi, of course, was the capital of North Vietnam. He wormed his way in there and found out that what the American government, in, in, the, in the name of, of, the, of, the, of, the, of the LB, uh, Lyndon Johnson's administration, say we weren't bombing hospitals, weren't bombing uh, private homes in Hanoi, the capital of North Vietnam. Well, Salisbury goes in there and finds our bombs are doing everything that the government's, in our, our government was saying we didn't do. He writes this to the New York Times and oh God, they call him a communist, kill this guy. They hated Salisbury. Another guy, a friend of mine, about my age, was David Halberstam. And he was in Vietnam covering the war. And he was saying, we're losing the war. Our government is saying, Lyndon Johnson, our general is saying we're winning the war. And Halberstam, got in a lot of trouble. President Kennedy actually was there at the time, still alive, and said to the New York Times, we should get, get rid of this Halberstam. He's, 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 he's offending, he's not against, he's against the national interest. Well, in Iraq, there was no Halberstam and there's no Harrison Salisbury. The people we had were, well, the New York Times had a reporter named Judy Miller, who's buying all the lies from the, from the Defense Department, putting them in the New York Times. She, in the, she was in the pocket of certain people. She later on was, 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 was kicked out of journalism, at least out of the New York Times, but not before she had published a lot of stories that were taken to be the true stories, that there were weapons of mass destruction and all that stuff. Well, I think that this, all this happened because for the first time on our, on our memory, we have bombing in New York. 
I mean, there are people all over the world who have, who have, who have seen bombs, who have been in cities that are bombed, who remember in, in, in the periods of the 50s or 40s or World War II period, bombings all over. But our first experience of having bombings in our own country, in New York City, in Washington, et cetera, kind of just was such an, oh, had such a damaging effect, which is to say that the government took over what the notion of what is accurate, what is, what is printable, what is good in the national interest sense. And journalism was, has not been the same since 2001. It really has affected us. All right, Wilson. So thank you very much for coming. Please buy the book. Please have some wine and beer and have something to eat and uh, stick around.